Well, this evening we're going to uh, be looking at, um, again, the, the virtue of humility. And again, humility can be expressed in many ways. This is not by any means exhaustive, but only meant to help us understand or really to examine ourselves to see whether or not we are humble or whether there's areas in our lives where we need to humble ourselves. What I'd like to do is begin by reading James chapter 4. I'd like to read verses 1 through 10. And really what we're going to be looking at uh, are, uh, well, is in verses 6 and in verse 10. But there's, again, plenty of other scriptures we're going to be looking at this evening. So let's begin in James chapter 4. James writes this. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may splend, spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us, but he gives us but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening. Now, we're not going to look at everything we just read in James, but if we understand humility as we should, we would see how all those things uh, connect together. Now what I'd like to do is start by just making a simple observation of two things that I think are clearly taught in Scripture. The first is that in the Lord Jesus Christ we are all accepted and we are all beloved and we will all see heaven. That is something that is equally true of every believer. But I think it's also true and, and clear in Scripture that we are not all the same in God's eyes. There are some who are distinguished in Scripture as particularly close to God, as those whom he calls his friends, those who may be considered a man or a woman after his own heart. And I think the same thing holds true in, in history, especially as we've you know, just gone through the Reformation series in October, and uh, we're reminded, of course, not only of uh, Luther and Calvin and so forth, but those particular uh, men that the Lord put upon their hearts to go into the mission field, as we think about those past Reformation series where we saw some of those individuals that God used, such as George Whitfield, John Wesley, uh, Jonathan Edwards, uh, we see that there are some that the Lord used more powerfully in his kingdom. Uh, again, I've made reference to this gentleman uh, numerous times because I think it is remarkable uh, God appears in certain cases to hear and answer the prayers of some individuals more quickly and more powerfully than others. I mean, George Mueller, how the Lord continually provided for him as he really sought to be what the Lord would have him to be, as he sought to do what the Lord would have him to do. Uh, God answered his prayers in ways that uh, seem remarkable, at least you know, from the things we would typically experience. And the question we want to ask is this. What is it that makes the difference between them and between other believers? Is it, is it merely election? Is it merely God's choice? Is this simply predestined to happen? Well, in a certain sense it is, because everything that happens is a part of God's plan. Uh, 
But we do need to understand it's not entirely that. Um, if we understand God's sovereignty and His election in that way, and, and we really think it excludes everything that has to do with us, all of our choices, whether we decide to do right or wrong, we're, we're mistaken. Because all of those choices we make are, are equally a part of God's plan that He either allows to stand or not stand. The Bible tells us that there are certain things, as I've already mentioned, that God particularly prizes certain virtues that he values in us more than others, uh, that is, more than other particular virtues. Those in particular that, that make us more like his son. There are certain things the Lord singles out in Scripture that he promises to bless more than other things. Now, tonight we're going to look at one of those numerous virtues, and we're going to see a few more in the coming weeks. And uh, my, my goal behind this is that we might be reminded what it is that God sees as excellent, what he sees as precious. That we don't you know, spend all of our time focusing merely on not doing the things we know that he doesn't like or merely doing the things that he commands out of a sense of duty, but rather trying or seeking to put on those virtues that we know the Lord loves, and in so doing, becoming more useful to him because we're becoming more like his son. And really, these virtues are the things the Spirit of God is seeking to develop in us. But as you know, sanctification is a cooperative effort it's not something God does on his own. It's not something we do on our own. God works in us and we work along with him. So he shows us what he wants us to be. He gives us his spirit to give us that inclination. And as we were reminded, um, I forget now the gentleman's name, but not too long ago, we need to yield to the spirit of God. As we're told by Paul in Romans chapter 8, we need to walk by the spirit, yield to the spirit as he seeks to lead us in this direction. Now, the, tonight, the virtue we're looking at that he particularly loves is humility. James writes in James 4, 6, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And in verse 10, humble yourselves in the presence of God, and he will exalt you. You know, there are some people who are very proud about their pride, you know, but we need to see that pride is something God hates. He opposes those who are proud. But those he will bless, those he will exalt, those he will give grace to are those who are willing to humble themselves. So this evening I'd like for us to consider three things. What humility is. Secondly, the blessings that God promises to the humble. And then thirdly, how we might become more humble. And by the way, I, let me just mention ahead of time that the third point is probably my briefest point because I deal with it mainly under point one. So if you want to humble yourself, consider the things we see under point one. Uh, these, these are actually uh, very humbling. So first of all, the question is, what is humility? Well, humility is the opposite of Pride, you know, whatever pride is, humility is, is just the exact opposite of that. It means to be meek, to be lowly, to be gentle, to be mild, to be unpretentious. I think lowly is the key word there. Nehemiah Rogers writes, humility is the repentance of pride. And Bernard of Clairvaux calls it self-annihilation. Now, since this is a virtue that the Lord wants us to put on, it shouldn't surprise us that our Lord Jesus Christ himself possessed it. He is our perfect example in everything after all, isn't he? Our Lord Jesus Christ says of himself in one of, the, of his most affecting uh, gospel calls in the book of Matthew, Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy 
and my burden is light. Our Lord Jesus Christ is, is gentle. He is humble. He is the example of what we are to be. By the way, I just couldn't resist in mentioning that um, looking at our Lord's example of how he uh, gives this gospel invitation, uh, we need to be reminded when we give the, the invitation, as it were, when we're witnessing to others that we do it as our Lord did it in a humble and gracious way. We don't need to feel like we need to get up on a soapbox and point our finger and stick it in somebody's nose and condemn them uh, in order to bring them to Christ. Uh, we're reminded again and again in Scripture that it needs to be with humility and with gentleness. Paul writes this in Colossians 4, verses 5 through 6. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Sometimes we look at those examples of preaching to vast crowds and we think, well, that's the how we need to witness one-on-one. -on -one. But no, it's, that isn't the same thing. Witnessing one-on-one -on -one does require, well, both examples certainly would require grace, grace in speech, humility, gentleness. Uh, but sometimes, of course, forcefulness um, and authority when preaching uh, to large crowds. Peter writes this in 1 Peter 3, verses 14 and 15. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. Now, there's a verse for this morning. Do not fear their intimidation. The Pharisees were great on intimidating uh, the crowds and intimidating Nicodemus and intimidating the officers. Uh, the world's going to try to intimidate us, but do not fear their intimidation. Do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So again, the, the call uh, to be humble um, humility means to be gentle, it means to be lowly, it means to, uh, hum well, to, it's the opposite of pride, self-annihilation, self-deprecation. Now, it's, it's one thing to say that. It's another thing to really understand what it looks like when it's actually present in a person's heart. Uh, how can we know whether or not we possess humility? How can we know just exactly how humble we really are? Well, here's where we get the opportunity to examine ourselves. Now, first of all, we need to understand humility is a matter of the heart. It's not merely a matter of, of outward actions or what we do, although if we are humble in heart, it will work its way out in our actions. But just because our actions may appear to be that way, it doesn't mean that they are. The outward appearance of humility without the, genuine, the genuineness of inward humility is really only hypocrisy. It does need to be real. We need to understand God knows. God said to Samuel when Samuel went to Jesse's house to anoint the next king of Israel and thought that the strapping young man who was standing in front of him must surely be the Lord's anointed, he said this to Samuel for Samuel 16, 7. Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. <clears throat> so we need to understand to begin with that the heart is what God's going to be looking at, not just the outward actions. We can't simply give to God an acceptable humility if it's only in our outward actions. So we might say on the other, well, okay, so on the one hand, it has to be genuine, it has to be inward, but on the other hand, we do need to understand if it is in our heart, if we truly are humble and are humbling ourselves before the Lord, it will work itself out in the way that we actually live. Now, the first thing it will do is give to us <clears throat> a realistic opinion of ourselves, of who and what we really are, that we won't think that we're better than we are, and interestingly, we also won't think we're worse than we are if that were really possible. <laughs> Paul writes in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, 
For through, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. We do need to see ourselves as we really are. Now, when we look at ourselves, how should we do that? Should we look at ourselves as in Christ or should we see ourselves as outside of Christ when we are making this evaluation, or I should say apart from Christ, as we are in and of ourselves? Well, if we look at ourselves as in Christ, with his perfect righteousness clothing us and his absolute perfection, uh, we can only see ourselves as perfect as Christ is, and that's not going to be a humbling thing. But if we see ourselves outside of him as we are in and of ourselves, that will humble us. And we do need to ask ourselves the question, how did those who were in Scripture, when they looked at themselves, how did they view themselves? Well, how did David view himself when he wrote in Psalm 22, verse 6, I am a worm and not a man, clothed in the righteousness of Christ or without? Uh, John Gerser once, when he was lecturing on this verse, said something interesting. He said that David, in saying this, actually insulted the worms. Because the worms at least do what God made them to do, but man rebels against him. Well, clearly David here was looking at himself apart from God's mercy. Apart from God's mercy, he was actually lower than the worms. And what about Paul, when he writes in 1 Timothy 1, verse 15, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Now again, I think we can understand Paul saying this if he used this in the past tense. I was foremost of all. I mean, he was the one who persecuted the church. He was the one who tried to destroy it. He was the one who was persecuting Jesus Christ by persecuting his people. But he says here toward the end of his life, I am the foremost sinner of all. Was he looking at himself in Christ or apart from Christ when he said that? Well, again, he was looking at himself as he is in himself, apart from the grace that God gave him, although very much aware that Jesus had given him that grace and his sins were forgiven. He was cleansed. If you would be humble, that's how you need to look at yourself. That's how you need to view yourself. We were all born in sin. We all came into this world guilty, deserving nothing other than hell. That is all we have ever deserved. And even since we were born, all we've done is sin. Okay? That's what you and I deserve for our sins. We deserve hell. And the only reason that you and I are ever going to see heaven is not because of what we've done, but it has everything to do with what Jesus Christ has done. It is true that we believed, it is true that we trusted Jesus Christ, but it's also true that we only did that because of the grace of God given to us when he gave us his Holy Spirit. And of course we know that was something he determined from all eternity. Now again, another way that we can, as it were, grow in our humility is, is understanding that even now that we're in Christ, even now that we've received his righteousness, his love. Now that we've been made new creatures by His Holy Spirit, we still need to ask ourselves the question, how well are we doing? Are we now living up to that standard? Are we now what the Lord calls us to be? No. We still fall so short of what the Lord calls us to be. We still don't do it right. We still don't do what the Lord calls us to do with the right heart. There is still so much self so much sin, so much of the old man that gets in the way. I mean, Paul describes it in Galatians 5 as, as though there's so much of a struggle that we cannot live in the way that we would like to live, and that should humble us. John Hooper once wrote this. He says, oh, this evil heart of unbelief, and he was talking about his own heart. Lord, I am hell but you are heaven. And again, John Hooper was a very godly man, just like the Apostle Paul who says, I am the foremost of sinners. If that was how they viewed themselves, how should we view ourselves? 
Unbelievers often tell themselves how good they are, but believers tell themselves how bad they are. When Isaiah was lifted up to heaven and he saw God's glory, the first thing that he said in Isaiah 6 verse 5 is this, Woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. One thing that will humble you more quickly than anything else is getting a glimpse of the holiness of God. Uh, if we compared our lives to Isaiah, how would we come out? And yet Isaiah, as he saw the glory of the Lord, describes himself in this way. But I do want you to know, because Isaiah humbled himself, the very next thing the Lord did was he ordered one of the angels to take a coal from the altar and place it on his lips. And he says, you are cleansed of your iniquity. And that was a picture, of course, of, of our Lord Jesus Christ and his work in cleansing us of our sins. But we need his work because of the sinner's that we are. Now we also have to understand that even if we could, with God's grace, serve Him perfectly, we would still have every reason to be humbled because we're only doing our duty. Remember the parable of the unprofitable servant. Jesus says in Luke 17, verse 10, So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. There's no room for boasting in God's kingdom. Uh, we should humble ourselves even if we could. I mean, do we do all the things which are commanded of us? No, we don't. And that should humble us. But even if we could, we'd only be doing what we should be doing. And there'd still be no reason for praise. Jesus says we should still call ourselves unprofitable or unworthy slaves. Now again, this, we're, we're trying to get a picture of what humility is and, and what it looks like. We do need to have a clear view of ourselves and our unworthiness. But when you do, when you do get a clear glimpse of that, when you are humbled by that, another thing that it does is it gives you the ability to accept the fact that you are imperfect and that you do sin. And as a matter of fact, when somebody comes to you and tells you that you've sinned, you're willing to accept it because you're well aware of it. You know it's true and you're humbled by it. You know, David writes in Psalm 141 verse 5 that he actually welcomed those who would be kind enough to point out his sins. He says, let the righteous smite me in kindness and reprove me. It is oil upon the head. Do not let my head refuse it. When you're humble, you can receive that kind of criticism. You can receive that kind of rebuke, that admonition. You can have your sins pointed out. It's only pride that can't bear it. When you're humble, you can even accept it from those who don't do it gently and who don't mean well, even from those who hate you, knowing that the Lord is the one who is sovereign over those things as well. And if he's brought this person to reprove you of a sin that you know full well that you may be guilty of, that that is his will. When Shammai, or Shimi, I guess you would pronounce his name, cursed David when he was fleeing from Absalom, Abishai offered to King David to kill him. Let me kill this dog, get him out of the way. But David said to him, and he said to all of his servants in 2 Samuel 16, 11, Behold, my son who came out from me seeks my life. How much more now this Benjamite? Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him. David understood. He deserved it. You know, it was because of his sin, and he was humbled by his sin. And that would be his sin with Bathsheba, his sin with Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba's husband, having killed him. The sword would not depart from his house. All of this came about because of his sin. He was humbled by it, and he says, This comes from the Lord. The Lord has told him to do this. Leave him alone. Now, going on, when you're humble, you also will not take credit for what you do. And in more, you know, uh, uh, let's say accurately, what the Lord does through you. You know how it is, we, we like glory. We like credit. We like people to tell us we've done well. But whatever comes our way, if we are humble as we should be, 
then we should be willing to give that credit and glory to God. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7, What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You see, the only thing we can do uh, is, of course, what God gives us to do, but it's God who has actually enabled us to do it, and he should receive the glory. So being humbled means that we understand that and we give the glory to God for anything that we might do. The skillful, you know, anything we're able to produce with our hands or with our minds or any of the good fruit that comes from us. We acknowledge what Jesus says is true in John 15 verse 5 when he says, apart from me you can do nothing. But of course if we abide in him and he abides in us, we will bear much fruit. It comes from Jesus Christ and so we give him all the glory in other words we take the crown off our own heads and we place it on his head because he is the one who deserves the credit uh, when you're humble you don't view other people the way that you view yourself and I think that's kind of an interesting point isn't it because otherwise we'll look at them as the chief of sinners and we'll put them down but humility says we don't look at them in that way, but we look at them as being better than ourselves. Paul writes in Philippians 2, verses 3 through 4, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of of others and again I would ask you have we ever had a better example of this than in our Lord Jesus Christ who being in the form of God emptied himself took on the form of a man and being found as a man he humbled himself to become a curse for us on the cross he set aside his own needs he set aside his own pleasures and he lived and he died for you that is what the Lord would call us to do he considered that our needs were more important than his and that's what we are called to do as well but you can't do that unless you're actually humble when you're humble you rejoice that others are better than you more important than you when John saw Jesus he realized it was time for him to move aside and let Jesus take the center stage he said he must increase but I must decrease further when you're when you're humble basically um, well, well, we'll see in just a moment that we'll also rejoice when others do things better than us. Uh, when you're humble, you're willing to spend time with, with all the brethren, and it doesn't matter who they are, whether they're the, you might say, the highest or the lowest. Uh, sometimes, you know, we see people come to Christ and, and maybe... You know, we see certain things about them that we don't find attractive, and maybe we avoid them for that reason. But when you're humble, you understand that they're better than you. You're lower than they are. They're more important. And so you spend time with them. Uh, to put it in other terms, um, you would rather sit at the gate with Lazarus than to eat at the table with the rich man. Uh, James tells us in James chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, that we need to be careful not to show favoritism. And of course, we'd only do that if there was a you know, certain pride in us that wouldn't allow us to. James writes this, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? See, the humble person would spend just as much time with the person who's dressed poorly as the one who's dressed richly. When you're humble, you treat all men the same and you don't show favoritism. When you're humble, you don't compete with others to try to one-up them, to try to come out on top. I think we all understand what, what that's about. You're happy when, somebody, when the Lord uses someone else to bring greater glory to himself 
then perhaps he has used you. Thomas Watson, in A Godly Man's Picture, writes this, A humble Christian is content to be laid aside if God has any other tools to work with which may bring him more glory. That's a hard one to swallow, isn't it? When, when you have pride, that's what you deal with. But if you're humble and understand what you really are, that's not so difficult to do. Instead, you rejoice that God's using them. Now, the only area which the Bible actually warns us to compete with other believers where we can try to outdo one another or come out on top is in the honor that we are to show one another. Paul writes in Romans 12, verse 10, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. More literally, he's saying try to outdo one another in showing honor to one another. That's... That's the only thing we can try to outdo one another in. And along those same lines as we, not this evening, but as we progress in the series, we're going to look at the idea of serving one another. How do you try to outdo one another in showing honor? Will you, you serve one another and you, as you become a servant, you bestow honor on other people. So you try to bring attention to them rather than to yourself and your own accomplishments. When you're humble, you don't blame God for the difficult circumstances that you have to face, the trials you have to endure. Instead, you, you blame yourself. It's interesting, when Nehemiah considered what the Assyrians had done to Jerusalem, broken down the wall and so forth, he didn't blame God. He didn't actually even blame the Assyrians, but he blamed himself and he blamed Judah and he blamed their sins. And in his prayer to God, in Nehemiah 9, verse 33, he says this. He says, you are just in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully, but we have acted wickedly. He vindicates God, and that's what humility does. It doesn't blame God for what you're going through, but rather it justifies God and says, you are blameless. It's my fault, not yours. On the other hand, you also thank God for every blessing that the Lord gives to you because you know you don't deserve it. You, you deserve all the bad things. I deserve all the bad things. But we don't deserve the good things. And so we thank God for every single good thing that he brings. Uh, Jacob, when he was returning from Paddan Aram in Genesis 32.10, prays this. He says, to the Lord, I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and all of the faithfulness or of all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. Those who are proud complain they don't have more than they do. Lord, why haven't you given me more? But the humble wonder why they have so much. Lord, why have you given me so much? Again, remember that example of the, the man that was in this old shack and somebody was passing by and he heard all this commotion coming from inside the inside this old shack and so he thought he would you know steal up to the house and look through one of the slats and see what was going on and he sees this poor old man sitting at this table this old wooden table with this old wooden chair who has nothing but a piece of bread and and a cup of water in front of him and he says all this and Christ too and it just humbled the man that this guy would be so excited about how little he had but he realized he didn't even deserve that Lord you've given me all this and Christ, too? Humility will make us thankful for what the Lord gives to us. Now, again, there's many more things we could look at as far as what humility looks like. When you're, when you're humble, you're not going to take into account the wrong things that other people do to you. you. You're going to understand, hey, I deserve that, and I deserve much more. When you're humbled in this way, you can love even your enemies because you realize that you're worse than they are. You know, we, like I said, we could go on and on about all these different things, but I think we need to move on to the second point. And, and again, the second and the third points aren't as long as the first, but let me, just, let me just move on to the second. Why should we want to be humble? You know, why, why should we want to endure all the abuse that people might, you know, dish out to us, all the difficulties? Why would we want to humble ourselves, if, especially if we really happen to believe that you know, we, we may be better than somebody else, which, again, we should never think. 
Well, again, it's because of the blessings that God promises to those who are humble. Plus, it's real. I mean, we really should humble ourselves because the things we just looked at are true about us. We deserve hell. There's nothing good in us. But we need to understand that God also gives us an additional incentive as far as what he promises to do for those who are humble. Now, again, because of time, I'm just simply going to read the verses because they're very plain. And we can look at these, again, as incentives to be the kind of person that the Lord wants us to be, to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think James 4, verse 6, is a very good summary of what it is God is willing to do. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Do you want God to stand against you? Do you want Him to continue to bring those various trials into your life until He actually does humble you? He's opposed to pride. As long as you are you know, thinking more highly of yourself than you ought, you can expect to find God to be your adversary rather than your friend, but adversary in a good way if you are a believer, of course. God will make sure that He humbles you, but if you will humble yourself, God will give you grace. Now, what is this grace that He gives you? Well, again, what is it that makes one man different than another? Why do we remember Abraham? Why do we remember Paul? Why do we remember, of course, um, you know, Whitfield, Wesley's, and these others? It's because if you humble yourself, God will exalt you. Again, James 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. The Lord will answer your prayers if you are willing to humble yourself. The Lord said to Solomon in 2 Chronicles 7, verses 13 through 14, If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The Lord will lead you. The Lord will teach you if you are humble. The psalmist writes in Psalm 25, verse 9, He leads the humble in justice, and He teaches the humble His way. By the way, I can't help resist thinking about even some of the wicked kings, even some of the wicked kings of Israel, who are willing under threat of God's judgment to humble themselves. God relented of the calamity that he was going to bring and he didn't judge them at that particular moment though he realized that he was eventually going to do that. The Lord will prosper you if you will humble yourself. Psalm 37 verse 11, but the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. God will save you when you are in trouble. Psalm 76, verses 8 and 9. You caused judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still when God arose to judgment to save all the humble of the earth. The Lord will honor you if you will humble yourself. Solomon writes in Proverbs 29, verse 23. A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor and again the idea of this exaltation the Lord says he will watch over you if you are humble Isaiah 66 verse 2 but to this one I will look to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word now again as we think about why it is that those we read about in scripture or church history were able to do all that they were able to do for God's glory it certainly has much to do with this, that they were humble. Think about Moses. Moses said, uh, although it, it doesn't sound humble when somebody writes it about himself, but it was in the, the Pentateuch that Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. Perhaps, uh, perhaps a later editor that included his, uh, his death also wrote that in because Moses was a very humble man and the Lord used him mightily. Humility is much more important than we may think, which is why Thomas Watson wrote this. It is better to lack anything rather than humility. It is better to lack gifts rather than humility. No, it is better to lack the comforts of the Spirit rather than lack humility. 
What does the Lord require of you but to walk humbly with your God? Humility is very important. So the last question I simply want to ask is this, how can we become more humble? <laughs> if humility is the path that leads to these blessings, how can we humble the pride of our sinful hearts? Well, the Bible gives us two basic ways, the law and fasting. And of course, I'm taking into account the fact we already have the Spirit of God. We can't do it without Him. First of all, compare yourself with the standard and take a good look at yourself. As James talks about looking in the law of God as a mirror, seeing what it is you're like. What, you know, what is the standard that we are to live up to? Well, the standard is perfection, isn't it? Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 48, Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And if you want to know what perfection looks like, just read the Gospels. See what Jesus was like. And then take a good look at yourself. How much are you like Him? Where do you fall short? Um, you know, what we looked at, as I said in the first section, is very helpful here. And I think that our failings in each of these areas should help humble us, help us to understand that we haven't made it uh, the way that we may think that we have. I, I keep thinking about my own experience when I was much, much younger in the Lord, and it's not that I've made it, I've just become a bit wiser, but in those days I used to look at the life of Christ and, and saw what he did and think, you know, it really wouldn't be that hard <laughs> to live like Jesus lived, and little did I know the sin of my own heart and the righteousness of Christ. It's, there's a huge chasm between those two things. But let your failings in that first area as we've described what, you know, what it means to be humble, let it, let it humble you. you know, where do you fall short in these areas? The pride, let the pride that's in your heart humble you. Your unwillingness to accept your shortcomings and your sins, let that humble you. That you want credit, that you want glory for yourself. Let that humble you, you know, rather than giving it, of course, to the Lord. That you, well, that we view ourselves often better than others. We shouldn't be doing that. That you get angry with others who do better than you do, especially when they do it in an area where you consider yourself to be somewhat proficient. Humble yourself over the fact that maybe there are other believers that you don't want to spend time with because you don't like the way they look, you don't like the way they act, or maybe they just don't measure up. Or that you get angry with God the way you do when the Lord sends trials. Why are you doing this to me, Lord? Well, again, it should be, why aren't you doing more to me, Lord? So let your sins humble you. Let your lack of Christ-likeness humble you. Let your lack of faith and trust in the Lord humble you. Let the fact that you fall short of what others have actually attained to in this area and short of what you might have actually accomplished or obtained, let that humble you. And then secondly, in addition to your self-examination, fast. You know, fasting is another way that the Lord has given us to humble ourselves when we fast we see just how weak we are. We see how dependent we are. We see how mortal we are. And when we fast, it also allows us, by God's grace, to see the sins of our heart more clearly. Fasting in Scripture is called humbling oneself before the Lord. But the important thing is that you humble yourself. James writes in James 4.10, again our text, humble yourselves. In the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. If you want to be a friend of God, if you want to be somebody the Lord can use, if you want to be somebody He will use, you must humble yourself. Well, like I said, we've only scratched the surface on this particular topic, but God prizes humility. God blesses humility. It is in our best interest to humble ourselves before the Lord in, in all these different areas and even more.
so that he might use us, that he might give us the honor. And the exaltation, I believe, is just the honor of being used by the Lord, whatever that may mean in our particular lives. Well, let's, let's bow in prayer and let's, let's ask silently that the Lord would humble us and help us to walk humbly before him that we might be more usable.